My name is Rich Wagner, and I'm president of Bellwood College of Technology. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the C. Charles Jackson Leadership Lecture Series, which occurs the first Thursday of every month, and is an uh, exciting initiative that has been spearheaded by the Alumni Board of Managers. So I want to say thank you to the Alumni Board for all of your hard work in making this happen. I want to welcome Mark Faulkner, who will introduce today's keynote speaker. Mark is the president of the Alumni Board of Managers. Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. It's my pleasure today to introduce our keynote speaker, Russ Becker. Russ is the Chief Executive Officer and President of API Group Incorporated. API Group is one of Minnesota's top 25 private companies. It ranks number five on the ENR top 600 contractors list. API Group is a parent company to more than 40 complementary construction businesses throughout the Midwest. <laughs> API provides fire protection, industrial, and specialty construction throughout the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. Under Russ's leadership since 2002, API has grown to $2.5 billion company. Russ received his undergraduate and Master of Science degree in civil engineering from Michigan Tech University. His career became as a field engineer in attorney contracting. He moved on to Ryan Construction become, before becoming president of API Group subsidiary, the JMR Company. He became president of API Group in 2002. Since two, 2007, Russ has served on the Dunwoody College of Technology Board of Trustees. He is also chair of the Minneapolis Children's Hospital and Clinics Board Directors, serves on the advisory board for the Construction Management Program at Michigan Tech Technology. Techno, Technological University is on the board for the Construction Industry Roundtable. He's an active member of the Young Presidents Association, Minnesota Business Partnership, Greater MPS, and also a youth hockey coach for Monomita High School Varsity Hockey Team and Monomita Youth Hockey Association. I know why their program's on the upswing. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Russ Becker. So I'd rather talk about hockey than I'd rather talk about any of this other stuff. And uh, it's a good thing that my boss isn't here because he'd be wondering when the hell does the guy get time to do his job with all that other stuff that he's doing. So, uh, so I got to tell just a little story. So my my oldest boy is left uh, left uh, out to go actually play in the USHL next year. And so he uh, he's down in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and I'm trying to figure out. How can I keep track of them a little bit better? So I decided that I needed a Twitter account. And uh, so some of the young, young guys here in the room and gals would, would appreciate this. So I had to have my sophomore set it up for me because I couldn't figure out how to do it. And then he starts asking me, he says, well, do you want to follow ESPN? Well, that sports enthusiast, that seems like it makes a little bit of sense, right? Well, Dad, would you like to follow the NHL? Yeah, yeah, that seems like it makes make a lot of sense. Well, Dad, would you like to follow, you know, U.S. College Hockey? And Dad, would you like to follow the Sioux Falls Stampede? And Dad, would you like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, he hands me the phone, and there had to be, like, 98 of these tweets. So I still haven't figured out how the hell you guys get your homework done and keep up with your Twitter accounts, because it's, <laughs> it's totally overwhelming. So, um, obviously, that's not why I'm here today to talk, but... Uh, um, Building great leaders, and when when um, when Rich first talked to me about um, taking some time to come here and talk, leadership and leadership development has been a huge part of our company, um, really since I joined the corporate company in 2002. Mark really already stole half of my material, so the best part is we might get done done early. So, but um, but we have been on a journey of leadership development for, for many, many years. And, and leadership and leader development, it, it is a journey. It's not something that you click a switch. It's not something that you just say, hey, you know, I want to be a leader. I want to be a great leader. It's something that takes time. It takes energy. It takes investment. And more than anything, it takes commitment. And it takes a lot of commitment. And uh, I can remember having the conversation even back when I was still working for, for one, of our, one of our companies. Um, we had started, kind of started and stopped a little bit of this conversations about leadership. We had a couple of meetings. We formed a special committee. And, 
had some meetings and, and uh, the guy that was running the company before me um, just was like, oh, we're too busy. And we stopped. So this would have been 2000, 2001. We stopped. And I got promoted in, in 2002 and I started working at API Group and one day my phone rings. And it's a gentleman by the name of Ron Magnus. And Ron is with uh, uh, what used to be formerly the Fails Management Institute, um, which is now FMI, the leading consultant in the construction industry. And he's like, he's like I'd like to re-engage you and Lee. Lee Anderson is our, the primary um, stockholder of API Group. I'd like to engage you and Lee in leadership development. I, I remember having the conversation. I said, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it if we're going to stop. I'm not doing it if the first time business slows down again, that we stop. I'm not doing it. And to Lee's credit, more than anybody's, we've never wavered. So since 2002, our company has spent in excess of a million dollars a year on leadership development. And I would tell you, in today's world, we're spending in excess of $2 million a year and it's probably more than that if we really truly tried to, to figure out how much are we spending and how committed to, to leader development are we. So we talked, Mark talked a little bit about this, two and a half billion in revenue, 200 locations. So Western States Fire Protection, which is one of our largest companies, will have 270 million in sales this year. They have 34 locations. Each one of those locations needs a leader. In the construction industry, you know, anybody can go out and buy welding machines, pipe threading machines, game boxes full of tools. Anybody can do that. Anybody can get access to that stuff. It's one of the most fragmented in industries um, in the world. The cost of entry is very low. You have a pickup truck and a set of tools, you can get into the business. And uh, every, one of those, every one of those businesses needs a leader. And this industry is totally about people totally about people. And when I look at our businesses, the success or not so much success in all of our locations is based on leadership. We're in the life safety, oil and gas, mechanical, structural steel. I see Chris Arthur, who's a Dunwoody graduate. She, she works at Lejeune Steel. She runs our, our design group. Um, 15,000 employees, 3,000 of them work in the office, 12,000 work, work in the field. So we're privately held an interesting aspect of our company. Before I get into more conversation about leadership, is that 35% of the company is owned by the employees. That was something that uh, Lee and Penny Anderson did back all the way back in 1985. So 35% of the company is owned um, by an employee stock ownership program. Our purpose, building our purpose, building great leaders. Back in 2002, one of the first things that we did. When we sat down and we started to re-engage our conversation about leadership and leadership development is we constituted a purpose statement. That purpose statement was building a safer environment. Now back then, you know, our company was 600 million in sales. Probably 400 million of it came from the fire protection industry. And when you, when you say something like building a safer environment, and you're a fire protection company, that resonates. You, you know, you, it makes sense. When you talk about Lejeune as an example, you talk yourself in the back door about how that makes sense to you. Or at least that's my, my feeling. And so we had had a lot of conversation within the company about does, does the statement building a safer environment resonate with every one of our businesses? Is that, can we get fired up about that? Can we get out of bed in the morning thinking that when I go to work, my purpose is to build a safer environment? And the answer, when we really were honest with ourselves about it, is that it was a struggle for some of the companies. So we, we took some time. There's, we have a gentleman, I'll talk a little bit about Dan um, later on in the show, but we hired a guy actually from FMI, so um, a guy that had worked with us for many, many years, and we got to know each other. And, and over the course of time, we just agreed the best thing to do would be for Dan to come to work for us. Dan is just an amazing thinker. And um, Dan and I went to work and started talking about what is our purpose? What, what, what do we stand for? And every time we talked, we kept coming back to leadership and leadership development. And so 
one day, we just basically landed on building great leaders. And as we went out and talked to our companies about how does that sound and how does that feel to you, it, it resonated. Now, the challenge for us is that how does everybody relate to that? If, if you're the person that's coding payables in the accounting department and you, you're building great leaders, how does that resonate with, with you as an individual? And, and that's, a, that's a huge challenge for us as we reconstitute our, our purpose and we move, move forward because every person in the organization has to feel that they're empowered as a leader. Everybody. The person that's pushing the broom out in the warehouse has to feel empowered that they're a leader in order for us to be successful in transforming our business and taking this across, across the whole company. And it's a huge challenge for us. We've done a great job with a kind of a small, small slice, you know, of, of our team of people in the organization. But we have to figure out as we move forward, how are we going to continue to touch people? And that's a struggle for some, some business leaders. It's a struggle for some people to say, how does that person that's pushing the broom in the shop, how, how do you unleash their brain and allow them to lead in your organization? That person has some great ideas. That person absolutely has some great ideas. And as an organization, if we're really going to be successful and accomplish everything that we want to, we need to harness that. We need to go have a conversation with them. That person's been pushing the room. He's been watching people do things, I don't want to use the word stupidly, but been watching, those, watching people do things poorly, inefficiently, for many, many, many years in some cases. How do we go? and get their great ideas and incorporate them into our business. That's what building great leaders is about. And as an organization, we've got some challenges because now by making that comment, we've made a commitment to everybody in our organization, all 15,000 people, that we're going to invest in them as a leader. And that's a really cool challenge. And that gets me fired up and gets me out of bed you know, every morning when I think about it. So we've reconstituted our purpose statement to building great leaders. And we've done this within the last six to nine months. So we're passionate about it. Our values, this is super important. And young people here that are sitting here today and you're thinking about what are you gonna do with your life? You have so much opportunity in front of you. It's amazing. You're in the driver's seat. The, the, the talent war is on for business. And I look at some of the business owners here that are here today. Finding great people is a huge challenge, which means a huge opportunity for you. And when I'm interviewing people, one of my favorite questions I always love to ask them is, so, Joe, you're talking to this company, this company, this company, this company. And I'm going to assume that the job is going to be about the same, the pay is going to be about the same, and the opportunity is going to be about the same. What's going to differentiate? What's going to differentiate that opportunity for you? It should be right here. What does that company stand for? What are their What are their values? Because if they don't have strong values, it's going to be reflective in the culture of the organization, and ultimately, you're not going to be as satisfied in as you continue along your career path. Values are super important. We're a highly acquisitive company. We probably buy eight companies a year. Um, might be more, might be 10, it might be two. Some of those companies are $2 million in revenue, and some of them are 180. But we're gonna buy companies every single year. We're gonna do, make acquisitions every year. We're gonna hire people every single year. And this is the most important thing. Do they align with our values? I'm going to go buy a company. <coughs> I'm not an accountant by education. I, I mean, I, it's like there's this mystery around acquisitions. You know what the, the mystery about doing a good acquisition is? Get the culture piece right. Get the people part of it right. You hear about all of these acquisitions that continue to blow up and you know these mega deals and everything. The, the, the reason that they don't work is because the cultures 
are, are just totally conflicting. When we buy a company, I don't care if it's a $2 million business or if it's a $180 million business, if they don't match, if their values don't align with our values, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. If we're hiring somebody to come to work for us and their values don't align with our values, we won't hire them. And it doesn't matter how, how badly we, we need that person. It's just, it's such a huge part of everything you do. The one thing that makes us a little bit unique in our organization is our last one, where when we buy a company, we don't rebrand that company. That company continues to operate under the name that they were. We want the leadership team from that business to stay in place. We want that, those the employees to stay, stay as part of that team. And the reason we bought them is typically they're a very successful business in the marketplace. And so we have to figure out how to continue to serve our customers with that sense of that individual company, yet harness the energy of a $2.5 billion organization. We don't tell our companies what to do. We have an inherent belief at API that if you're running a business for us, that you're a smart person, and that you, that you are, have a thirst for knowledge, and that if we expose you to a better way of doing things, that you'll do it. I, can, I, I think in the 12, 13 years that I've been running the, the business, I've sent one edict out and said, you have to do things this way. And it wasn't about an operational deal. It was all about insurance and making sure that they were, we were managing our risk properly from a contractual standpoint. One time in, in 13 years. And yet, in the same breath, I would tell you, I just screwed something up, didn't I, Katie? <laughs> that that it, it makes a big difference, and it makes a difference in how people will engage um, what they're doing. What did I do? <laughs> oh, okay. I just wanted to walk up <laughs> She, If anybody's wondering, she's actually running the place. So. <laughs> Sorry, Rich. I think everybody knows that, Russ. <laughs> so why do this? You know, I touched on it. I touched on it earlier. Number one, there's a huge talent shortage facing the construction industry. People often ask me, why did you join, join the Dunwoody Board? Well, to be totally honest with you, if I'm just being totally honest with you, is I'm selfish. I mean, we need the students that graduate from this college to come to work for us, not our, not our competition, but come to work for us. So it's, it's, super, it's super important. I mean, yeah, you could say I, I want to give back to the community, and that's true, okay? But it's really selfish. It's, it's to help the industry be successful. There's a huge talent shortage, and it's only going to get worse. It's only going to get worse. I talked about it earlier. We have 200 locations. Each one of those locations needs to have good leadership. I often tell people when, when I'm evaluating our business, I have a one box flow chart. And the arrow that goes in and it says, you know, if you're looking at it, you're saying, geez, this business is struggling, this business isn't doing well. The one, box, the one arrow that goes into the box says, do we have the right leader? And if you can answer the question yes, then you can go to work fundamentally on what, what's wrong, why do we need to fix it, what's going on in this business. If the answer is no, you've got a different, you've got a different you know, kind of decision that you have to make. Can I coach the person up? And sometimes, unfortunately, you have to coach the person out. But it's, it's that simple. Do I have the right leader? When I first started working for, for EPI Group in 2002, answering that question objectively was the hardest thing for me that I could, I could do. I couldn't do it. I struggled. I went from peer to boss. Back then, we probably had 18 companies. And all of a sudden, these people that I was on that committee with and everything else that started and stopped, you know, which, you know, you, when you get done with the meeting or whatever, you go out and have a beer, and, and you know, they're your friend. They're your peer. You commiserate with them. You bitch about your boss to them. All that stuff, right? And then also one day I'm, I'm their boss. 
and then all of a sudden I have a business that's struggling. And I have to look and I have to go to that box and I have to say, do I have the right leader? That was hard for me. We have an obligation as an organization. I have an obligation as the, as the guy running the place to make sure that we have the best damn people running our businesses that, that we can. And I learned a long time ago, if I, if I asked myself this question, would I have a beer with the guy or gal? Yeah. If I would have, a, well, I have a beer with you. And the answer is no. You're kind of already answering your question about do I have the right leader? And when I pull into a parking lot and I see, I see a reserved parking sign, I can almost tell you I got the wrong person. Who would do that? I mean, who would do that? So I can tell you a funny story. So we're having, every year, we get together, you know, a couple times, just having, like, a wine and cheese party in the office. And, and uh, you know, I'm the typical guy. You know, I come flying in the parking lot. I got, I'm on my cell phone. You guys don't be paying attention. But I'd be on my cell phone, and, you know, I'm coming in like my hair is on fire three minutes late for a meeting. You know, too much, too much going on. I used to always park right in the front, right in the same spot. Now, I didn't have my, didn't have my name plate on it. So one day I, I pulled in, there's probably a visitor sitting parked in that spot that I always parked in. And so I parked someplace else. And we had to happen to have one of these wine and cheese parties. And the guy looks at me and says, you're not in your spot. He said, nobody knew you were here. I was like, I don't have a spot. He's like, oh, yeah, that spot right in front. So we're at the wine and cheese party. A little while later, young young lady, sales manager for us comes up to me, she says, not parked in your spot. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, I don't have a spot. So I made my, made my mind up. I park in a different spot in the parking lot every single day. I'll, I'll park all the way around the building and slug my bags all the way up through the back staircase. You know, just because I don't have, I'm not going to be that guy that's got a spot. Did not going to be that be that guy. You guys are kind of tough crowd. This is pretty funny story. So, <laughs> yeah. so this first guy that comes up to me, and I've been doing this for about two or three weeks. He says, Russ, he says, I got to tell you. He said, you're just totally messing with the karma in the building. He says, driving people crazy. You don't know if you're here or not. There. And every now and then I'll drive my wife's car. <laughs> I don't need more cars. But, but there's a huge need you know, in, in our industry for this. And, you know, the, the beautiful thing about, about our company, like when I started at API Group in 2002, I was 35. 35. Ted's in the construction industry. Not many companies are going to put a 35-year-old person in charge of a $600 plus million dollar business. In our company, it's, all, it's always been about who can get the job done. Who can get the job? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're man or woman, black or white, young or old. It's, it's who can get the job done. And I think that that's really cool, and that's the, way, that's the way it needs to be, and that's the way it should be. But there's a huge need. Our industry is starved for leadership, just started for leadership. And there's opportunity every, every corner you turn around. What does a great leader at API look like? Well, they're humble, they're a servant, they, they have more of a servant leadership style. I really don't, I don't even know, sometimes you get all that stuff marked right off, you gotta wonder what I do during the day, but sometimes I wonder what I do during the day. But my job is to help people be successful in what they're doing. My, that's, that's it. My job is to clear roadblocks and help people so that they can win. They have to have, in our company, they need to be urgent. They need to have a sense of urgency. Problems don't go away. They never do. They never have in the history of man. Problems don't, that are there don't just go away. So figure out how to deal with them. And be professional and be courteous, but deal with them. And make sure that there's clarity on how you're gonna, how you're gonna deal with them. You have to be results driven. Right? You, have to, you have to win to be a successful leader. You can say everything you want, but if you don't have good results at some point, people are going to turn around and say, geez, you know, what's going on 
with this person. You have to be able to build relationships, especially in this industry. This industry is just, like I said earlier, it's all about people. I can remember my first job and I was working in the field for attorney contracting. I used to think I had, I, you know, I got a master's degree in civil engineering. My first job, I'm the receiving clerk out at the uh, refinery. There was a huge, the clean fuels project was going on out there. We had 3,000 craft on the job. That's it. I mean, anybody, that's a huge project. I was the receiving guy. That meant, you know, when a truck full of pipe fabrication showed up, they called Russ. And when, a, you know, some equipment showed up, they called Russ. Well, that job proved to be one of the best learning opportunities that I had in my entire career. Not only did I learn about all the components that went into a highly complicated refinery project, but I had to interact with every trade. I had different crews of people working for me and I had to deal with all of our project people and project managers and project, I, I, I can't even tell you how many relationships that I built that I still have to this day. And we have business leaders, I talked like Jim Torberg, who's the president of Lejeune Steel. He was theoretically one of my bosses when I worked at Journey Contracting. And we turned around, you know, 10 or 15 years later, and he's working in our organization and our team. So building those relationships is huge is a huge huge skill and it takes investment it's not texting it's not emailing i can't stand it when i go to have a meeting or something and somebody sends me an email thank you not that i don't appreciate the thanks don't get me wrong well how about the that power of a handwritten note geez sue thanks for taking the time for meeting with me today i really enjoyed learning more about your company those, those skills are priceless. And relationship skills in our industry are, are very important. How do we do this? I mentioned earlier, we've invested, we're investing $2 million a year in the, in the leadership development. The Leadership Institute, you know, is something that we still use, we go out, it's really the only thing we go outside for anymore. That's through um, FMI. We've sent 850 people to the Leadership Institute since 2002. API Group pays the tuition for everybody that goes. 850 people. I would tell you that during the course of our journey, we forgot about the field. Not purposely. I think just not thinking enough about it. And it's something that we've really, in over the course of the last 12 months, have really changed our focus that we're going to invest in the people that work in our field as human beings. Everybody that, everybody, every time you talk about field, and you talk about foreman training and superintendent, you know what they want to talk about? They want to talk about tactical skills. They want to talk about how do I make this person schedule their jobs better? How do they analyze their work in progress schedule better? I don't care about that. I shouldn't say I don't care about it, but I want to invest in those people as people, which is becoming a bigger and bigger and more and more important part of, of you know, how people are choosing where they're going to work and where they're going to spend their time. We have leader labs twice a year. We bring 120 of our, of our leaders together for a day and a half. We talk only about leadership development. We do not talk about any business results whatsoever. It's how can I make, help you become a better leader? twice a year. We have regional leader labs. So we have small leader labs all around the country. We hired a gentleman from West Point seven or eight years ago, and his name's Mike Shantz. He's an amazing guy. And he teaches all of these leader labs and moves around the country doing these leader labs because we need to continue to invest in our people. We have emerging leader labs. I mean, we got everything, I guess, you know. But we look at, you know, who, who are those high potentials in the organization? And how do we help them know that they're high potential? So that they want to continue to invest in our company, in, in their career, in our company. We have a leadership development program. I see Scott King here. Scott's son-in-law is a young man by the name of Huck Finn. He's a West Point graduate. Came through our leadership development program. 
He's been running a business for us in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and he's moving, moving his family back here um, this spring to take over the, the leadership of one of our companies. We will go out, we will, have, we will interview young people. What's that? You're just in a dead spot. Oh. Keep moving. We'll go, we'll go out and we'll hire young men and women. The first year of their career with our company, we'll rotate them between seven of our different businesses. Most of these people don't know anything about construction, but they have innate leadership skills. And at the end of that year-long period, we'll place them in one of our businesses. We don't hire them for the program unless we, at some place, can see that they have the potential to run a business and run a company for us. So we have other different, um, all sorts of different leadership development training courses and everything else. We hired a guy, I mentioned Dan Woldridge. His, his title is Strategic Leadership Advisor. I couldn't even tell you where Dan is at today. Dan, Dan just sets his own schedule, and basically his job is to coach, coach our company presidents and to help them be more successful and help them as leaders, not as a, not as a businessman, as a leader. How do you drive change in your organization? You know, all of those things that take time and energy, and not enough people are thinking about those things. We're in the process, I'm in the process right now of bringing a gentleman in as our chief learning officer. And we're going to double down the investment that we're making in our employees and our people and what, we're, what training opportunities are out there for them. Project leader, of course, inside out coaching, mentorship. We encourage all of our people to have a mentor, everybody. I've had a number of different mentors. Obviously, Lee Anderson serves as a mentor for me today. But mentorship is a huge part in your success. If you don't have a mentor, I strongly encourage you to seek one out. And it needs to be you seeking that person out, not them seeking you out. But we provide service management, branch managers, home and home, an interesting concept. We have all of our, every one of our business leaders, every single year, we want them to go visit somebody else. Go spend three or four days there. I don't care if it's a fire protection guy visiting a structural steel guy. Go visit them. And then we want them to come see you. Because every time you make one of those trips, you're going to learn. You're going to learn from each other. And having that highly collaborative you know, organization is much better than telling people, do this, do that, do this. <coughs> We're in the process of putting a learning management system in place. Sometimes I get concerned that we have too much technology in, in our business. But this is providing that, that platform for online learning for all of our businesses. And it's something, if we're going to succeed in our quest to, to um, touch everybody from a leadership development perspective, we're going to need something like that. Because it's physically, I've, I've never, I haven't been to all 200 of our locations. It's almost physically impossible, especially when you're adding 8, 10, 12 every single year. And so how am I going to touch all of those people? And the work environment is something really over the course of the last two years. I joke around, we have a business in Mitchell, South Dakota. You walk in, some of you, some of you, the young, younger folks in there might not get this, but remember your, those 1970s parents, my parents' house? The old paneling, orange shade carpet? Well, that was our office in Mitchell, you know? <laughs> so you're a young, aspiring, graduate of Dunwoody College and you walk into that and you're going to go for your interview. I'm guessing that you're thinking not so much. You know? <laughs> and, and the work environment has become more and more important. You know, you, you hear about all this stuff. People, a young person comes in for an interview, they're going to look and see what kind of technology. You're going to interview with me and you look and I pull out my flip phone. <laughs> this guy's with it. <laughs> I got a Twitter account, don't forget. <laughs> All of that stuff, creating an environment that's positive from a work environment standpoint is hugely important in the business world today. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be the fanciest and the glitziest, but that environment is super important. Do people feel recognized and appreciated? That's part of the work environment. It's gotten to the point where I can walk into a business and just about feel what kind of environment. I can look around, I can tell if they cleaned up just for my visit, that's that's easy. People think that you know you can't tell. You know what I mean? It's like that little 
box there where you moved whatever that shadow on the carpet or whatever that's like a dead giveaway you know it's just like come on people if you're really doing your job you don't have to clean up when somebody comes and when you walk around and you ask people questions you can tell right away what kind of an environment is this and it's something that you know business businesses need to really spend more time focused on so lastly how do you measure? You know, people always say, what's the return on the investment? And, and I always say, I don't know. And it's something that's really hard, it's really hard to measure. But all I can tell you is that in our organization, our commitment to leadership and leadership development, you don't grow from 620 to two, two and a half billion in 12 years if, if, it's, not, if it's not working. Because you got to be creating a pipeline, and you, there's got to be people in that pipeline, and the people that share your values and understand what's expected for them. And not only that, but our profitability has grown by two and a half times as a percentage of our sales. So for me, when I look at it, it's easy. Any one time, at any one given moment in time, can I give you the return on investment calc? No, I can't. But over 13 years, I can look at that and I can say the investment is surely worth the effort. So I appreciate you listening to me. Clearly, you guys didn't have anything else to do this morning. <laughs>